Okay. Hi, my name is David Gwen. I am here with Jeff Rainey, who is being interviewed as part of the Pride of the Community Oral History Project here at the UNCG University Libraries. Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, just to start, um, if you could tell us maybe a little bit about your background, uh, where you're from, where you went to school, etc. Well, I was born in 1959 at Cone Hospital in Greensboro and never left. <laughs> Not the, not, not the hospital, no, no Greensboro. <laughs> um, so I've been here a lot of years, mm -hmm. and, and I love Greensboro. With the high school <laughs> I went years? To, yeah, uh, you know, back in my day, there was elementary, first through six. I went to Hunter, and Jackson was junior high, and then I went to Smith High School. Excellent. So, um, and you graduated then in 1977. 1977. Right, okay. That must have been an interesting time to be graduating. It was. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of turning 18, because I know that is the <laughs> magic moment when it happened, uh, when did you actually start visiting bars and clubs in Greensboro? Um, if it was before you were 18, that's okay. Uh, um, actually, I, I was 18 because in, in that day you could be 18 and drink beer and wine uh, out in public and clubs and stuff. And right. It was still the brown bagging for as far as hard liquor went, but I, I was 18 before I actually went to my first club. Mm -hmm. So what were they like in those days? I mean, I, what, what were the first kinds of clubs you actually went to? Basically like neighborhood kind of bars, mm -hmm. um, Hooray Harry's, uh, and then uh, also I, I was a part, you know, I was an old hippie but then turned into the disco era, so I went to Daddy O's mm -hmm. and um, um, all kinds of just I would pop in. I, I like neighborhood type places better, but I, I would go to the to the larger dance halls. So to speak. Okay, excellent. Um, um, anything you particularly remember about some of those seventies clubs? I imagine it was it was interesting in those days. It, it was very laid back. A lot mm -hmm. of the a lot of the places there, you know, wasn't DJs per se mm -hmm. yet. It was more jukebox kind of things or bands. You know, right. little small bands, but so those first clubs you were going to, would you say had, they had more? Was it more of a primarily straight crowd, mixed crowd? Mm, primarily straight, but but a, a, a mix, okay. a, a bit of a mix. Once you crossed into the disco era, it's, it was hard to tell. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all, all those shiny shirts and tight pants. You know, you didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, um, we'll, we'll talk about crossing over then. <laughs> um, when did you first start going to gay clubs in Greensboro? Uh, the very first one I ever went to was Davies, which is here, on, here on UNCG <laughs> campus now. Um, and my, my friend Scotty and I, uh, he had a fake ID because he was 17, but I was 18. But he's the one that told me about it. He came out, he was, came out when we were in high school and and you know it, he was curious and that was real interesting the first night going in there it was very very odd i mean very new experience and walking in the guy at the door scared me to death <laughs> he went he was my first flaming queen that i'd ever seen in my life and i was like oh wow and then you know got up in there and it was all leather daddies and I mean yeah, it was it was a shock the very very first <laughs> walking in uh, I remember the first night we were there I guess they they smelled new meat or whatever but <laughs> this guy came up and handed Scotty a little business card that had the handkerchief codes on it which he and I knew absolutely nothing about but we read what color you put in what pocket to do what it says, and we were never more handkerchiefs in our pockets in the clothes anymore. But and it was it was a it was a dive kind of place. But my favorite thing about it, it had a sunken in dance floor. It was like I don't know, I don't know what it was before Davies and 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 what could have made that. But their dance floor it was very small, but. It was, you went, you walked down to it, and so therefore it was a railing that you looked at people dancing. Maybe a pool or something. I don't know, it could have been. So, um, were you out when you went there the first time? Or? I, I actually, I had a girlfriend in high school, and she and I, 
had two friends that, that both came out in high school, so she and I, uh, I enjoyed going out with our friends to the gay places. Oh. And and so, it, now the first time I went was just with my friend Scotty, and it was, you know, I, I was curious, I mean, I was wondering what was going on, but I still had my girlfriend, so. <laughs> um, okay, well, uh, can, after that, Presumably, you went to some other bars. Oh, <laughs> can, can you tell us about any other bars you remember? I mean, I've got a list of some of the ones here, but you kind of know where right. they were. So, right. uh, yeah, well, any that you from from Davies. Uh, the next, the second bar I ever went to was the Palms, which to this day remains my favorite. <laughs> it was, it was just. I mean, it was just because it was open seven days a week. It was, you know, not crowded, but. It was always just a neighborhood clientele, and and it used to have a jukebox before the days of you know and pinball machines, and I mean that's that's kind of how it was, and and Joyce the bartender was wonderful, and then of course there was Wham, which was the disco, and that's that was the big you know elaborate light up dance floor, <laughs> uh, swirl swirl your partner do the hustle club that yeah. that all that you know that that era started and that was a fun time that was a real fun time in in in, yeah. in life and music actually <laughs> music well okay disco sucked but <laughs> it, was, it was it was a lot of fun yeah, what, it, what kind of crowd would you see in there you at, at Wham, on an average it, night it, at Wham was more um starting to be the glamorous gays you would see you know the hairdressers in their Beautiful women they brought that they did their hair and you know that that was their best friend and right. and um, and then you know uh, a, a younger kind of crowd it was it, it was it was the dancey the people that liked to dance and and mm-hmm. all that. Right. Well, how about as a, how about then as opposed to the Palms? What was, what was the crowd like in the Palms? The Palms was an older crowd and and way more laid back. You know they, they wasn't. Very much dancing going on back at, at the first part of the palms, you know. Right. Um, but um, it, it, it was like I said, more neighborhoodish and and mm-hmm. older older people, way cruisier. I mean, because Wham was uh, you just you know you dressed up to go there and and you wanted to be seen and and you wanted yeah. to hit the dance floor and twirl and <laughs> all that. So. Yeah. Um, and. Mostly men, men and women in these places. Um, there wasn't a, a large lesbian crowd per se. It was the women would be more the followers of their gay boys, and you know the the, the pretty girls and and that. And it was like even at the Palms, I don't remember there being a whole lot, a whole lot of lesbians very hmm. much. I, I think. I think that there was a separate bar, maybe that the women, the gay women, went to. Right. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, it, it was it was a mixed crowd, but it was mainly mainly man, male. Okay, so yeah. we're talking late seventies, early eighties, <coughs> kind of at this point, right? Now, right. right. Um, and if I remember right, Wham then became something called Encore. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which that that transition, I mean. See when it was Wham is when you know the um, like I said it was still the big disco era, but it was also the crossover of a little bit more grunge music. And I remember Wham is where I met uh, my favorite drag queen Lily White because um, the guy Irv Palchek who owned Wham brought. Uh, her and her other two drag friends up from Atlanta and they moved to Greensboro and that was the first drag queen I ever saw that did Patty Smith so I lost my mind <laughs> I was like wow they're not they're not doing Donna Summer <laughs> what is this and and that that caused a whole little brand new crew of us folk that that uh, the little punk rock crowd started coming in just to see the punk rock drag queen and that that made an interesting little combination for 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 the mainstream of what what had been going on there. So, 
I bet so. Actually, I was going to ask about that later, but now this might be a good time to jump in. Uh, sort of, uh, you were sort of two worlds during the time because you were doing the gay scene, which was right. uh, the disco, dressy, dancey scene, but you were also doing sort of the alternative music scene at right. the time as well. Um, you know, the non mainstream music, which there was a lot of going on in Greensboro in the early 80s. Yeah. Uh, you talk a little bit about, maybe about some of the places you went, uh, some of the things you saw there, and how maybe that scene was different or how it related to the gay scene. Well, it, you know, every club that I went to that was, you know, more grunge and, you know, um, gosh, Old Miracle House, uh, Cat's Cradle. Mike. Um, I just realized you don't have your mic on. Oh, I'm still picking you up. Okay, good. No, I'm talking about <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, when I'm going, like, you know, not Greensboro Chapel, like Cat's Cradle, I mean, when I would see, go to those kind of places, I I would always find a, a nice mixture of folk. I mean, it never, yeah. I never, I never felt unwelcome anywhere that I went. I mm. mean, I always thought I was a rock star, so I was like, just get out of my way. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see a lot of crossover between the two? or? Uh, a bit, yeah. I mean, I would see folk say that I saw at Daddy O's every so often, you know, those straight couples pop into Wham! And you could tell they were terrified. They, they weren't as comfortable. Like, my girlfriend and I were very comfortable because our friends had come out and we were comfortable with that and we we liked the whole you know disco thing and and we had we just made our our whole group of friends around that excellent okay um well any other um we'll get we'll get on to bars where you worked a little bit later on but i think where are we? We're still around 1985 or so now. Is that, right, that right. about where you'd put us? Yeah, Which is yeah. a couple of years after we met. Um, anything else you'd like to say about what was going on at that time? Anything you remember? The 80s Any? were a blur. But, okay. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, it's, I mean, I, it, was, it was a fun time. I mean, I, I, I was working in record stores, mm -hmm. and so therefore I had that going on, and that was a, a big focus. I mean, I, I got free tickets all the time. I got to see so many shows. And even in, in the seventies before I started working at record stores, Greensboro had, you know, great concerts that in my high school days, I mean, you know, for five or six bucks, I mean, I saw Led Zeppelin, the Rolling Stones, the Who and Queen all in one year. <laughs> <laughs> and it was festival seating. You just killed yourself and got right there. I mean, I, I, I touched my chat. <laughs> I mean, so I've always been crazy about music. I mean, yeah. of all, all genres. So, you know. Right. And you were at uh, the Peaches and at the Record Exchange, right? Oh, and at the uh, Record, record Bar. Bar. Yeah. <laughs> and and right. the Record Exchange, yes. Yeah. Um, so great. Okay, well, about the, uh, you know, the mid-80s, we started seeing, um, um, you remember a bar called Busby's? Oh. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I remember both locations because there were two, and that that was okay. Well, Busby scared me, <laughs> and then the first one downtown, uh, the downtown location that that was just a strange place because you sat on uh, empty beer box case <laughs> cases of beer bottles. I don't know. It was just, it, I mean that was just a, a pure cruise. I mean you walked in there and. and you were either eating up, you know, alive, or that's what you went to looking for. But it, it was nasty. I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I want to push back a couple of years because I, I, I don't think you're going to be able to do this. But I'm just I thought of it as we were talking about downtown. Did you ever go to any of the really older bars like the Rendezvous or the General Green? No. Some of those early ones. I, 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 they were, I know they were before I your time. Them, I think there was some maybe Happy Nights or something. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. My friend. One of my best friends yeah. uh, that was also a drag queen, Marilyn, I think, you know, he was five years older than me, so mm -hmm. I think he mentioned Happy Nights, but I never never went to any of the Davies was, was my very, very first experience wow. in Greensboro. That must have been interesting. Yeah. Right. Well, about this time, um, you started working 
in gay bars as well, mm -hmm. um, which I believe the first would have been XTC. Correct. Can you talk a little bit about a how that came to be and me when it was like moving working there? Yeah, it was well. It came to be uh, Liz uh, Liz Hamilton who owned it. Um, just got a group of friends. She had been a bartender at Wham when Wham was open, and so she was very open and loved the gay folk and. So when Wham went to Encore, um, she didn't work there anymore. She was doing restaurant bartending, but she just had had this idea that she she wanted to open up a smaller gay bar. And we used to meet at her apartment. She had just a, a couple of us, like six or seven of us, that she gathered, and we all gave ideas. And she got the ball rolling and. It, it, it was it was a neat neat little place to work. I, I started out just as a bar back. I wasn't a bartender mm -hmm. till later on, but um, you know it it, it was it was just a, a, a neat. It was a small place, but it was it was neat. And, and she was real supportive of the drag community too. So the odd thing was we had Tuesday night drag shows, which was unheard of. You did you know drag shows were always on weekends for the bigger yeah. bars, but it worked so well because. All the really good ones didn't have any bookings anywhere, and so she was able to get some top quality things, and it became like our biggest night. Now Saturday night there wouldn't be five people <laughs> in a gay bar on Black Point Road because they all went to Encore, you right. know, the masses. But yet Tuesday night we we would be at capacity, and so it, it was it was a fun little switch. Yeah. And it, it was, you know, I, I bless her for that, yeah. for that place at that time. Yeah. And it was open seven, seven days a week, yeah. right? And um, like a lot of bars I know in Greensboro during that time, it didn't open until really late, like nine o'clock at night, right? Yeah. And was that, that was a fairly common thing among bars yeah, then? Yeah. A except I think maybe when the, I first went to the Palms, they may have opened at like seven. I'm not positive, but that was that was the thing about the gay folk that <laughs> you just didn't go out early. Yeah, I mean it, it's you know, and, and then you were mad when it was two o'clock in the morning. You had to go home. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> like, well, what are you supposed to be doing? <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I think XTC. I think we opened at nine. All right. Yeah. So, do you remember? Was there anything uh, you particularly liked about working there, or didn't like? Oh, um, I, I liked. Uh, I like everything about it. I, I like the clientele. It was, it, it was a fun clientele, and um, I did. I like you know working working with Liz. Um, she was she was fun. Um, it being on High Point Road sometimes caused a little bit of a scariness, but but the way it was set up, you remember that the, the front door. You paid your admission and you got your ID checked and had to be buzzed in. So it wasn't like anybody off of High Point Road could just walk in. But you did get a little bit of, you know, uh, being a bar back, I would also be the one that took the trash out and going to the dumpster. And you, you'd get some stray scary out in the parking lot sometimes. But it was, it was yeah. never really, a, you know, any kind of harassing per se it was just right. more curious people I guess yeah I know there was the door gauntlet you had to run at any gay bar in those days because there were, were membership clubs yeah in order I mean that was <laughs> the, the law in, in order to sell mixed drinks liquor by the drink you had to be a membership club and some people sold membership most people just you know would, would just have a, a notepad up there you just sign <laughs> you know, but, and you had to get a guest to sign you right, in. Right, a guest to sign you in. That was so, <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> yeah, it was very odd. So you weren't ever really, really terribly nervous working well, there. Right? No, it was no. a little more like that. No. Right. Yeah, okay. Well, you said that, uh, that Liz and XTC were very um, friendly to drag and all drag community in general. Um, yeah. Talk to us about drag shows. Oh, I love and, drag shows. <laughs> But punk rock, live punk rock shows and drag shows are my two favorite things, which makes no sense to anybody, but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and they, I, yeah, um, is the, the drag nights were just crazy. I mean, one of my favorites, Jamie Monroe, who's still around to this day, started 
her career at XTC. I mean, right out, fresh out of Salisbury, North Carolina. <laughs> Cute little hippie boy, long, beautiful hair. And then would put on some makeup and be the prettiest little woman I've ever seen. And, and I mean, Liz did that, like would take these beginners under her wing and get folk to help and get them on up in that pageantry world, which mm -hmm. that, that's a whole different thing. It always kind of bored me. I like, I like just your regular weekly drag shows. Because <laughs> the pageant, pageant thing is just as bad as Miss America the real yeah. one. You know, they're they're backstabber bitches up in there. <laughs> XTC did host some pageants. Yeah, 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 they did. They did. I bet that was fun. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it was crazy, maybe, because XTC had good intentions, but the space was almost too small sometimes. When Blizz started out, well, to do the whole drag thing, there was no dressing room. Well, what? <laughs> you know, I mean, how are, how are these people with feather boas <laughs> and evening gowns supposed to get ready? And, and it was the 80s. How'd you fit all that hair in there? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And, and they had a big walk-in cooler. I remember one of the first drag shows, the people were back there with me when I was washing dishes. I mean, <laughs> you know, washing them, they'd be like, oh, don't open up that dish, watch my makeup's going to melt. <laughs> but, um, yeah. but yeah, Liz, Liz did good. It's, I mean, she was very supportive of that. And helped a whole lot of young starting out queens get on up in, in the world. I mean, Tiffany Bonet, one that does Tina Turner, is, Right now to this day in Las Vegas, doing Tina Turner six nights a week and making all kinds of money. <laughs> so, you know, and she started at XTC. So, uh, if I remember right, they also used to have turnabout shows. Where the oh Lord God, yes, <laughs> <laughs> just one. They had more. <laughs> I don't want to talk about okay, that. <laughs> I did the violent films. <laughs> I, I, did, I didn't do drag. I was like, no, I'll, 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 I'll just do some fun things. <laughs> the idea here is that the employees actually did the drag and, right. the, and, the, uh, drag and the drag queens were the, the bartenders. Yeah. And they didn't know how to make drinks. And it, yeah. it, was, it was a disaster. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> uh, after XTC, did you... Uh, I know that later on you worked at Babylon. We'll get there in a second. Did you work in the other bars in Greensboro? Um, after XTC, okay, well, before Babylon, I was, is when I started working at the Palms. Right. No, 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 I, I, I correct myself. I, I was going to the Palms regularly, <laughs> but that's, when we get to the Babylon part, that's, that's how that all came about was via the folk at the Palms. Well, let's, let's go there. Okay, now. well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> let's go to Babylon. I, the, um, yeah, Babylon, that's, that was a, a lovely time in my life. I mean, I was there from the day it opened to the day it closed. <laughs> and, and it was it was fun. It, the greatest thing about it was it was when downtown Greensboro was nothing except business. At five o'clock, there, there was, it was dark. I mean, there was nothing downtown on Elm Street. Mm -hmm. And um, Donnie, uh, Donnie Black and Ed and Darren got together and it started because of, God rest his soul, Ed LeBron having the cool little raves around town, the little ones at the depot, uh, at Fuzzy Ducks or uh, rallies or whatever it was called at that time. He would have these after, you know, after hours raves and that scene was just starting. And he also owned Spin, so he had access to all this underground DJs. That was a record store. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And because of the success of the little, you know, pop-up raves is how we even got started on thinking about the Babylon and having a, a building that, you know, that went on. It, it initially, we wanted it to be, to take over Encore. We wanted it to be the new big gay bar, just like that. But it ended up that the gay clientele was still true to the encore <laughs> you know and and, and and the warehouse or I don't know when it, when it even crossed over there but still did that and they weren't as supportive so that's when we started other alternatives which getting getting with Ed and then started the first Friday Braves that <laughs> were 
Well, one of the <laughs> well, the craziest things I've ever you know uh, bartended. I mean, seven hundred people <laughs> up in there from from ten o'clock at night till six. We stayed up until six in the morning, and the DJs and and, and I mean, at, after two thirty, after you know you had you could serve no more liquor at two o'clock. Had to be off of the floor by two thirty by law. Well, the line out front would be five blocks long because that was the 14, 15, 16 year olds waiting to get in. I mean, where, how do they sneak out of the house? I always, <laughs> I would always go, you know, I, I, I used to sneak out of my parents' house. I was still back in by 11. <laughs> but these children were lined up the street and, to get up in there and, and pay 20 bucks a pop and, and for these DJs. And they, they, we had some great, great name DJs, and so that that started that whole thing, you know. Of, so Babylon opened about what year? Do you uh, remember? Ninety four ish, maybe. It was, I think maybe ninety three. Okay. And you said you mentioned Ed and Donnie. They had a connection with the Palms, right? Right. Yeah. Ed, Ed Bronson. Uh, it, he, he and, and Darren. They they were both DJs. Uh, Ed was a DJ at the Palms, and. Um, it, it's just these little raves that I was going to, mm -hmm. uh, the little underground ones. I was talking about them, and then we just, I just remember mm -hmm. sitting one night with, with Donnie, and he's like, I want to open up a bigger place. He he, owned, he was also yeah. part owner of the Palms. Right. So he wanted to do that, and we just got to thinking and then found that great building. Yeah. <laughs> and Ed did an amazing job of renovating that. But yeah. um, We have I some mean, video of that that we might be adding. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, it was it, it was it was a it was a nice time. It it it, it made Greensboro downtown kick at night yeah. again for the first time. So you know you got all these crowds of people trying to you know what what, what <coughs> I know obviously this crowd was young from yeah. what you said, but what what generally was it? I mean, was it a uh, male, female, gay, straight? It was everything. It was, it was everything, everything, and nobody. And there, there was no judgment in yeah. Babylon. I mean, I. I God bless the children of, of, of that era that, that that grew, you know, the, the little kids because they were already smart enough to know there's no prejudice. I mean, yeah. <laughs> just, we, everybody just loved everybody, and it, it, it probably might have had to do with a lot of the ecstasy they were doing, but it don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, but no, it, there, there was no no judgment. I mean, drag queens would come in to the rays, and the, the kids just said, "Oh, hey, hey, yeah," you know. Well, wouldn't bat an eye, and 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 that that was fun. And now the funny thing is, the older gay people in Greensboro, if they dared to fall into one of the Friday night raves, oh, they were terrified to hit it right out the door. <laughs> I mean, I believe you did that when you visited one time. You came in for about thirty minutes. You said, "I can't take this." I couldn't take it because it, it was too just many a people. little too many people and a little too young. Right. <laughs> And but but that you know so we that's what made <laughs> Babylon kick and then we had the Sunday night disco nights which turned out to be real good that mm -hmm. that was real real popular yeah. and and that that got a great crowd of, of gay and straight people but you know digging up the disco music again the reviving that yeah. and and then we had a Saturday night where a DJ from Washington D.C. his name was Cedric uh, did house music and our clientele maybe be 500 folk there but our clientele was like all gay black folk and so it, it was a very diverse club and and, right. and and good good times I mean nobody yeah there was hardly any trouble that's per great. se <laughs> that's great well um I'm like like many good things that didn't end maybe as well as it could have yeah, but um, that that had to do with you know the divorce I mean the 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 disaster that happened with LeBron, the murder, okay. and then there was all this investigation, and then they they came down hard on on the first Fridays, yeah. and yeah, there was a huge raid. And yeah. do you feel comfortable talking about uh, LeBron or about oh, the murders I, I, at all? I, I, I liked him. I mean, I, I mean, I yeah. I had no problem with him. I I I hate what happened to him. I I think it was disastrous. Uh, you know, but he you know he had. 
had that way. He 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 loved him, loved him some young boys, and, and, and the young boys ended up being the death of him. And I hate to put it like that, but it's you know that's kind of what happened. He would he would always you know supply them with things and to make them happy, and that's what ended up. So he you know, people just, they turned on him. I mean, the kids just used the people used him a lot, but he allowed it. But then you know. His then demise was the two or three wrong ones. Yeah, yeah, so. it, was, it was awful. <laughs> it was awful. Yeah. And that sort of led to the uh, and his murder and the subsequent trial and kind of all the uh, focus and publicity on Babylon and, and negative on Babylon. Yeah, yeah. Led, led to the demise of Babylon. Right. And so there was sort of, as if I remember right, and you correct me because I'm probably wrong. I wasn't living here at the time. Right. Uh, there was sort of a, a last night, basically, which was, I guess, a big raid, maybe? or uh, Well, there, there was a, a, a last first Friday, uh, because it, there were DJs that, you know, from across the United States that were already pre-booked. And so, you know, to quote Queen, the show must go on. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, um, that, but then, then that Joey Medelloni, who thought he was the mayor of Elm Street, that that owned uh, the Inn Club and all that, decided he was going to come in the night that was our final night on a Sunday night, a disco night, and announce that Babylon would be gone, but it would still be open the very next week under a, a new name called the Sky Bar, and that he was going to be the owner. And he kept me on for that one month I could tolerate him. And then I, to, I mean, because Ed, Ed was still DJing, Ed Bronson, and he was still DJing on you know, the Sunday nights. And he, one of his stipulations was just been here and bartended from the day we opened until the day we closed. I want him to stay on his bartender. And I, I wanted to, because God knows I'd love that money back in those days. But yeah, I, that new management didn't, didn't set well. <laughs> so, and how did the cloud of the club do ultimately? It, it, it didn't last very long. It, either, it didn't did last it? very long. Not, mm. not as long as Babylon did. I mean, we we did five five years, I believe. Babylon was open right, right. almost to the day. Kind of, it was kind of spooky. So I think we opened in a May, uh, opened in May of when we opened, and the final uh, weekend of it being Babylon was in May. So it was almost. Right. I mean, it was crazy. Yeah. Uh, so after that, did you work in any other clubs or? They, or? Well, from from there, from Babylon. Actually, while working at Babylon, I was also working at the Palms. Also, while working at Record Exchange, I was kind of busy. <laughs> but but I, I continued. I stayed on at the Palms and until they wanted to make five parking spaces for the baseball field out. Of it. <laughs> And that that bar had been there. I mean, oh, God knows, I don't even know, thirty some years at, at least, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, it was Bushes. It was a, a, a beach music club before it was even the Palms, which is also ironic that before Wham was Wham, it was a beach music club that my uncle bartended at. So yeah, that was, I, that I, was I never the kind of understood right? about how the shagging beach folk ended up. Selling out to the gay bars. Kind of the cast, it was the castaway. Castaways, right? yes. yeah. That's what, that's what was the <laughs> yeah. bar. Yeah. But they, yeah, then yeah. I, I was at the Palms and until until its last day. So I'm, I'm notorious for closing down <laughs> bars. I guess. Which is why I guess I'm not working in one day. <laughs> so do you do you do you hit uh, do you hit bars and clubs much in Greensboro now? I. I don't. I don't go out anymore much to them. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I still like the smaller ones. I love College Hill. I love Wahoos. Uh, you know, and yeah. things like that. Just the little neighborhood type things. If I do anything, but I haven't. I haven't been to any anything. Even if there are any anymore. I mean, there's not really any big dancey kind of clubs that I even know about anymore per se. But. Yeah, I think chemistry is pretty much what we have now. Yeah, even and, even yeah, the Q lounge I, 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 down, so. I never cared much for for it. And yeah, it's it's all right. But. <laughs> I have one question. So you were working in bars in the eighties when the AIDS epidemic. Eighties and nineties. Yeah, when the AIDS epidemic hit. 
what was the talk like in the bar scene about AIDS? Okay, let me uh, let me just repeat it so we get it on mic here. Uh, you, when you were when you were working in bars in the eighties and even into the early nineties, uh, that was at the time sort of the peak of the AIDS epidemic. What was what what was the talk in the bars about AIDS like um, in those days? Or well, the very first time you know anybody ever heard about. AIDS on, on the news, Dan Rather, I remember saying something. Um, everybody was curious about it. And I remember the first three people I knew personally happened in the 80s, and then mm -hmm. it seemed like I went forever before I knew any, mm -hmm. any other people, because mm -hmm. Pat Brown was the first person mm -hmm. I knew. And that, that was devastating, because you know it was like so stereotypical. Oh, and Pat Brown and, and Doug Leonard and Mike Berry, they were all hairdressers. And you're just like, oh, the hairdressers, they went to New York, they went to the crazy sex bars in New York, and then they come back, and next thing you know, they're, I mean, because it, 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 it used to get you quick, yeah. you know, and, and it, it, was, it was very sad. But it, it wasn't, I mean, it, people started being, you know, they were more free condoms uh, at, at, at clubs. Um, you know, like uh, Tried Health Project doing doing mm -hmm. things, uh, doing free testing at the at we did that at the Palms a lot. Like at least once every six months, there, there would be a night that you, you know you were able to be tested if you wanted. And we always had um, condoms at the front door. You know, so it, the awareness you know blossomed, which was good because it, it, it was scary. I mean, at the beginning, just because. Like I said, you know, you heard about it, then all of a sudden you knew somebody, and then, oh, you hear that they just got diagnosed with having AIDS. You know, it wasn't even just HIV positive, it was, I got AIDS. And then they were gone, I mean, in less than a year. It was like, God bless, it really isn't a deadly disease. Yeah. So it, it was scary at the beginning, and then, you know, through education and stuff, I mean, folks started to get more aware, and it's, doesn't seem to it would it's not that it's not still talked about but it's not still I don't have friends you know that are HIV positive but at least now there's medication and you know they're I'm, one of my friends has been living now positive for 14 years so you know God bless us all now yeah <laughs> but yeah it, it 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 wasn't like when in the 80s it didn't really devastate the the crowd, like it, it wasn't like the big topic, but yeah, it was it was known, you know, and people were they get you know scared about it, <laughs> right? So I think I think Greensboro though always thought, well, we're not New York, we're not D.C., we're not Atlanta, you know, we're not a big city, so it's not it, that, that's what happens there, uh, it, you know, not, you know, San Francisco, we're not none of that. Where it's more rampant, that was just idiots in Greensboro. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, I mean, did you see it? Um, and this actually goes into one of the next things I was going to talk about. Did you see it changing a lot of people's sexual behavior? I mean, like the seventies were known for right. something of a pickup culture, right, or, or right. A, a random sex. Did you see? changes in the way people yeah, interacted a, 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 a and bit, hooked up but, that way? A bit, but still in, in the 80s whores were whores. I mean, we, 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 that's just how we were. You know, anyway, yeah, we just got more careful. <laughs> you know, but, but yeah, I mean, to be honest, it, it was still, you know, there's still a whole lot of a whole lot of cruising going on in the bars, you know, so, and deviant mm -hmm. behavior. <laughs> So how about outside the bars? Oh. Where we're... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's deviant behavior out there. <laughs> um, Greensboro had its its own set of sort of the notorious cruising spots. Mm -hmm. um, any of those that you care to discuss? Well, the mall. You don't necessarily have to admit <laughs> to anything. But... Well, well, there used to be the mall. There was. <laughs> I mean, the mall was the cruisiest place, and I worked in, in the mall at several different, I worked at clothing stores and record stores and stuff, but it, it was crazy just to go to your lunch break and be like, 
this is a big gay bar. <laughs> there are people lurking in every corner. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. And, you know, there's you know, campuses and um, rest areas. That, that was weird out in the woods. I mean, you just, just go, yeah. There, there was a lot. There's a lot going on in the, in the early eighties. You could you could find something, something, you know, dirty bookstores on High Point Road. I mean, if, commerce place. In commerce, yeah, that's odd. I mean, right downtown, we're in the businesses, and uh, that. That, that one little circle and it was just packed yeah, slammed packed you, with cars you'd come in sometimes at 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning after the bar closed and there'd be people sitting out there in lawn chairs oh yeah yeah <laughs> sitting on, on the hoods of their car I mean it, it was where you went after yeah. after Wham closed or Encore or what yeah I mean because it's just mm-hmm. down the street it, it was like where everybody that didn't get picked up at the bar went for last hope I guess and there are a couple of bars over the years right at the end. I think Busby's was there for yeah, a while. Yeah, it, it was down there. Yeah. And that's where the timeout was, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it, the same building, but yeah, yeah it changed names. But that, that's, yeah, those were fun little places. But it was, it was, a, it was a different day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We talked. You know, it was, it was fun to go to, go to bars and. and Look across the room and see something that piques your interest, and then have to really go up and introduce yourself and risk them going, Ugh. and you know that would devastate a whole lot of queers. For me, I care less. I went, oh, there's another one over here, and I'm just going to talk to you. I mean, I was, I was just that's how I was, and I was, I was brazen in my day. I mean, I would true lolly walk right up to you if I wanted to, to meet you, and could care less if you wanted to talk to me. Yay! Then that that happened. If not, could have cared less. But you know, nowadays it's, there's online. I mean, I, I can't imagine. I, I don't do it. I can't imagine going on online gay sites and trying to hook up with somebody that way because I want I want to I want to look at you. I don't want to look at your picture. That's a lie. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm glad I lived the day I did <laughs> because it, it it was it was a fun time to be around. I mean, it really was. It, yeah. It was cool. <laughs> Anything you want to ask before we? Um, can you speak? So, given the gay social life that you experienced, and now seeing what younger people are experiencing, can you speak a bit to that generational shift, that cultural shift in gay culture from the club scene, the covert club scene, and right. the scene, to now it being? you know, publicly acceptable to be walking down the street holding hands. Right. So that's just for the microphone, can you just speak to sort of the generational shift of what it was like I'll just paraphrase quickly from dark bars and places and cruising right. spots to, 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 to being to out the street. Relative openness now. Right. I, I, I think it's I think it's beautiful. It's like um I'd like to go to all the prods that I can around the state, and it makes me very happy to see how many young people are at the prods and and just happy whether whether they're gay or not. Just that they're they're just so accepting and and and, and loving of of the gay community, and it's nice to see even the older people, you know, out out at the prods. And I mean, you know. Well, you know, when when you and I went to New York the first time, twenty how many years ago? <laughs> more than twenty. Yeah, yeah, more than twenty. <laughs> that, that was you know like the first time that uh, I was telling you we went out that first night when we got there and stopping in to get a slice of pizza and I looked and I was like, oh, look, David, two boys are holding the hands. I said, this is so wonderful, and that was, that was like the first time I ever saw it open out in the middle of the street. Gayness, you know, it was always just seedy, dark, dark, dark place gayness that that I was used to, <laughs> not, not used to, but that I was accustomed to. And well, so I, I like the, the the transition now that with the prides that go on and and events and even in the high schools having you know LGBTQ uh, chapters in high schools and stuff, you know, and. Everybody being a little bit more accepted, you know. I've got a fourteen year old niece and she don't have any qualms about anybody, any race, creed, color, sexual religion, about anything, you know. So I, I love that because God knows I was raised 
quite different. <laughs> so, you know, I, I was I was scared to be myself in in front of my parents. And my parents still still to this day, but you, you can't change 80, 85 year olds, you know. But it's like I mean, still to this day, they'll see something gay oriented on on TV, and it just and my dad just can't can't watch it. And he can't mm-hmm. he can't see it, you know. It's getting more mainstream. I mean, you see guys kissing on Empire now, <laughs> you know, <laughs> on just regular, you know, yeah. uh, primetime TV shows that that you see people kissing, and that just you know, mm-hmm. I, I I love I love that I have lived through way before that that was going to you even thought it was going to be acceptable to now it, you don't even blink an eye <laughs> it comes on at 8 o'clock at night on, t- on channel 2 you know? <laughs> so did you ever 30 years ago think it was going to be like that in your uh, lifetime I really I, I even though I saw progression I didn't think it would I didn't I really didn't think it would be as accepted as it is now and I'm, I'm glad glad I was wrong <laughs> Yes. Us too. Well, is there anything else you would like to talk about? Okay. Uh, I, I think I've talked out. <laughs> anything else? Uh, okay. Well, thank you very much. It was uh, great talking to you. And um, wonderful. I think that's thanks it. for the opportunity, and I, I hope it hope it helps. <laughs> thanks.